My name is Pastor Chad. I'm the lead pastor here at Second Chance Church, and I am so thankful and honored that you would tune in today at our 11 a.m. service for our worship experience. Um, I hope and pray that today, through the song, um, through the message, that God would speak to you in such a unique way that you would experience Him like no other. So please know that from myself and all the staff pastors here at SEC, we are praying for you and we are here for you. Enjoy the service. Wow, let's, let's bow our heads. God, thank you. God, thank you so much, God, for what you're doing and what you've continued to do. God, you are remarkable. God, as, as that song played, what an, an amazing time of worship. God, we are so thankful that you that you would love us enough, Lord, that you would want us to, to commune, to, to gather, to worship together. And then you would be here present with us. How amazing is that? God, I got nothing but praise for you today. You know, when, when we can come together and worship, it's, you know, all the struggles and all the stresses of life seem nothing compared to your greatness. God, it's in you, Lord, that we can truly just feel loved and feel accepted. So God, this morning, through the message, through the music, through the serving, through everything we're doing here at SEC, God, I pray that we are glorifying your name. God, thank you. God, your holy and precious name we pray. Amen, you can have a seat. Good morning. Hey, I'm Pastor Chad, I'm the lead pastor here at SEC. And um, before I begin uh, with the message today, um, I just wanna speak for Pastor Heather, Pastor Dave and myself and, and Barry. Um, it has been an awesome, amazing um, October Pastor Appreciation Month. Um, thank you for your cards, uh, your text, your well wishes. Um, it means a lot, it, it really does. And, and you know, as pastors, I think Amanda said it, said it well a couple weeks ago. Um, there are things that go on behind the scene. Um, there are things that go on and, and I'm just so thankful as, as, a, as a pastor of this church that I have Pastor Heather and Pastor Dave and Barry just, you know, where I don't feel like I have to do this alone. That um, we have a, a group of pastors that really love serving, um, but most of all, we love God. And um, we obviously don't do this for the money. <laughs> um, we don't do it for um, anything other than just what God's called us to do. So thank you guys very much uh, for your love and gifts and, and cards. It's, it's greatly appreciated. Um, that kind of goes into an excellent segue to the message today. Um, this, this one's gonna hit me pretty hard as I was writing this week and I was uh, meditating and praying on it um, because what we will tell you um, is that a lot of times what God puts on our heart, um, it's ministering and preaching to us before we even step a, step a foot onto this platform. And, and I remember years and years ago, um, as you guys know, I'm a retired police officer. And, um, but I remember in my early, early career, um, I was um, pretty egotistical. And believe it or not, police officers being egotistical, it's, it's unheard of, I know. But I had these aspirations. I wanted to get promoted, I wanna do this. And, and what I started to do in my life was I started to volunteer for every program that I could lead. I mean, if there was a program or they needed help with something, I would volunteer for that. And because it wasn't because I wanted to fill the need necessarily, it's because I, I wanted to um, show uh, the higher ups that I could handle this responsibility. 
and my ego and my drive uh, to be something that I wasn't um, got me to a place about two years into my career is what we called OIC as officer in charge. And really what this was, it was a training position for anyone that was seeking to be promoted. And let me tell you, um, my ego could not keep up with what really was required out of the position. And as I struggled and, and really um, a lack of experience, I was brought in by uh, the chief and his staff and um, I was brought in to this, this table. And at that point, I was told that I was no longer gonna be an OIC and um, that hurt. And I remember my, my long walk back to my car and I had to work my shift that day. Man, I was just devastated. It was a huge blow to who I thought I was and what I was gonna be. And as God does, he dish, even though I was out for myself, he didn't leave me hanging. And as I, as I moved throughout my career, um, little by little, God just continued to, to pour into me. He continued to, to mold me and continued to, uh, to teach me valuable lessons. And I, and I look back, my signature line was more like a book than it was just the man that God wanted me to be, Chad Parks. And it's through those tough lessons, and I, and I would imagine a lot of us in here today can kind of relate to that, um, to those life lessons. Because what God was teaching me and what he's still teaching me was the thought of humility was the thought of, of not thinking of myself. And I think it's okay for us to have goals, but what does it mean when we're trying to reach those goals and we step on those that we love and we forget our families and we forget our friends in the process of trying to achieve those selfish goals. And so today, is a message that's gonna be on humility. Today is gonna to be a message that, that, that I wanna walk through that Paul writes. He just writes this beautiful piece in Philippians 2 that really, as I was reading it over, and I've been studying Philippians 2 for the past two weeks of, of what it truly means for us to live as Christ. You know, Barry talked about in this chaotic world today. You know, we, we live in this world where it's all about us. We live in this world where, where, where we wanna make it about us. And truly, when we look at Jesus and the life he lived, and he had every right to make it about himself, he made it about us. He made it about serving. He taught us how we could humble ourselves to live in humility. And so that's where we're gonna go today. And I'm praying that this message that God has put on my heart, it inspires you, it challenges you like it challenged me. So if you would turn with me, we're gonna be in the, the book of Philippians. We're gonna be in chapter two. If you'd stand with me as we read God's holy word. So Philippians two, and I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna preach, be, I'll be preaching and reading from uh, the New Living Translation this morning because I, I, I think it, um, I really like the words of this translation. So I'm gonna be Philippians two, one through 11 from the NLT. And this is Paul writing. He says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Verse five. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. 
Though he was God, he did not think of, of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. God, thank you for being, living this life, Lord, that gives us this example. And God, I'm, I'm thankful, Lord, even in our lowest of lows and our lowest valleys, you never leave us nor you forsake us. God, even when we're, we're thinking about ourselves, even when we're trying to make it about ourselves, when we're, we're, we're trying to do the things, God, you're still right there with us. And God, I'm thankful for the failures in my life. I'm thankful for when I didn't succeed or things went wrong because it's in those, Lord, is where I've learned the toughest lessons in life. And so God, this morning in this church and online, God, allow us to see you for who you really are. Allow us to experience your love and your presence. God, allow us to, to grow and allow us, God, and give us the courage to go where you're sending us. God, we love you in your holy name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. You know, when I think about this passage and I think about what God has done in my life and I think about humility, one of the things my, my good friend, Pastor Dave, and I think this is the third time I'm saying this, so eventually it's gonna be my quote, right? If you say it three times, it's your quote. But Pastor Dave used to say, and he still does, never seek position, always seek his presence. And I love that thought and I wish I'd have known that you know, 20 years ago. I wish I could have embraced that. Because when I look at the life of Jesus, the, you know, God in human form had every right to come down and be this ruler, to be this king, to be worshiped. But he took on human form to be a servant. And as I look at this, this passage, you know, there's all, there's all kinds of different ways to look at Philippians 2. And usually what we use to preach is, uh, this message on is to serve, right? We want um, you to get involved if you're not involved in a ministry to come and serve, especially if you call SEC your church home. And we use this passage um, for us um, to inspire us to serve, to do the things that God's calling us to do. And we're gonna continue to preach that message. But this morning, what I'm asking you to do this morning is to open your hearts, open your minds to where God will take you and show you areas in your life where there needs to be humility, where there needs to be places in life that you need to be humbled. And as I said earlier, God, God it really challenged me this week about the kind of leader I am here at the church, the kind of man I am, if I'm listening, if I'm doing the things um, that God has called me to do. And I believe that every instant there's something to learn. And there's no better example than Jesus. There's no better lesson to learn than Jesus. But looking back at verse five, Paul
Paul writes this, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, and I understand that. This is God. This is the creator. He created everything on this earth. He created you. He created me. He knew you before you're in your mother's womb. This is God. But, but Jesus, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Reading this, I can't help to think about what that means. What is the importance of, of, of that, of, of our God coming in human form? What does that mean? And if you think about it, if you watch movies and you think about gods, like Greek gods, right? I mean, if you read and, and you study what, what humans think of gods is they're all powerful, they're all mighty, they're all knowing. Um, they have this magic, they can do what they want and they rule with this iron fist. And yes, our God can do that. And yes, God could have sent Jesus down to rule like that, but he didn't. You see, God had a different plan. He had a different thought. He had a different process. And what I love about God is, is when he sent Jesus, he took a total different approach to reaching and giving you and I salvation. As I look back on the Old Testament, God sent prophet after prophet and warning after warning and nothing just like today, people were taken serious. They rejected those prophets. They rejected those warnings. And so God took a different approach. Instead of doing like he did back when he flooded the earth, he took a different approach. He came down as a man, as a human. He came down and lived a total different life. He came down and showed compassion and he loved and he healed and he taught and he broke bread and he lived as a human. He didn't come to be worshiped. He didn't come to rule. He didn't come to, uh, to, uh, to be this, this God that, that overtakes people. He came down with a total different agenda to serve, to show compassion, to show love. You know, to keep it in thinking about, to keep the thought of, of the Old Testament. The Jewish people are constantly, and they were constantly back then and still today, are looking for the Messiah. And here's what, here's what I've learned in my life, and here's what I think what I, I learned from the Jewish people, is that they like to, and we like to, put God in this box. Right, we like to, to have our own expectation of who God is. We like to, to put God in, in, in our reality to make him fit what we believe he should be. And, and same thing when, when, the, when the Jewish people, when the Israelites, you know, they're crying out to God in Egypt as slaves, help us, help us, help us. And God sends this unlikely man named Moses to help us people, what did they initially do? They rejected him because Moses didn't fit the idea of, who, of, of the leader that God would use to, to lead his people out of Egypt. We have these expectations and these thoughts in our head and of who God is. 
And so fast forward to when Jesus comes once again as the Jewish people are looking for this savior that's gonna come and be this military king that's gonna save them from the Roman empire. They, Jesus didn't fit that mold. And what did they do? They rejected him. Because what they thought, they thought when God came and the Messiah came that he would be this military God that would able to be able to set up his kingdom. And then he would, they would, he would take out the Roman Empire. But that's not what scripture says. And when God sent his son, when he came in human form, he came in such a way that it totally looked different from what humans expected the Messiah to be. How many of us today, to this very day, put God in this box that we have these expectations of what we believe God should be and what he should be doing. How many of us question what God is allowing on this planet? And if you really think about it, and if you really study scripture, what's going on right now is biblical. Rumors are war, famines, earthquakes, evil. None of us should be surprised about what's going on in our world today. Because if you read God's holy word, it tells us, he tells us what's going to happen. And when Jesus came down, when God sent Jesus down and and he became man, he became flesh and blood, he didn't meet the expectations of what the Jewish people thought the Messiah was gonna be. If Jesus walked through our doors in human form right now, would we know him What are we recognizing? You you see, Jesus was about humility. He was about love. He was about compassion. And he lived this life as an example for us. And as I look back at my life and, and I think about the things that I thought I should be doing, and I was doing things on my own. What I've learned time and time again, when I do things on my way and on my terms, I crash and burn and I hurt others around me. But what Jesus taught us, being a servant, he washed feet. He loved the sick. He loved the poor. He showed compassion to sinners. And he never, ever took a position, even though he had the right to. He never had that idea that I'm better than you. He was there to love. And when he went to the cross, he died a criminal's death. By his choice. So when I think about humility, and I think about the life that Jesus lived, and I think about back with the Romans and and the Jewish people, the Jewish people wanted and they thought that he was going to be this military God, this ruler. But Jesus didn't give us what we wanted. 
He became what we needed. And we needed a savior. We needed the sacrifice, the blood. Isn't that how awesome our God is? What we want, what we desire, but God gives us what we need. God showed through his son, Jesus, this tremendous amount of love and compassion. And so some of you are thinking, well, what does this mean? What does this mean for you and I? When we look at the life that Jesus lived, when we look at this this thought of being humbled, we look at this thought of this humility, I'm just gonna be blunt with you this morning. And some of you need to hear just like I needed to hear it this week. This life is not about you. If there's one thing this culture is, is, has taught me and continues to show is that our culture is making life about us. How can I get ahead? How can I get promoted? How can I do what I wanna do? How can I make me feel better? And what happens is when we continue to make life about us, and we make it about how I can get ahead, who I need to step on in the corporate world, who do I need, how, how I can get fame and riches and more likes on Facebook and more likes on Instagram. How can I bring people to see me? We find a, a country and a world that's stuck in isolation. Suicide continues to be on the rise. Loneliness is probably the number one thing that we see that our people are experiencing. Some of you are experiencing it. You know what I'm talking about. There's this loneliness, there's this depression, there's this this isolation. Even though I can pick up my phone right now and I can go live and I can see someone face to face, I can text somebody, I can email, I I can message somebody in an instant from around the world and we're still the, the loneliest, most isolated culture this world's ever seen. Because we've, we're making this life about us. And Jesus had every right to come down and be worshiped and make the life about him, but that's not what he did. He is counterculture. He's counter to everything that we were learning and everything that advertisers are trying to sell us. It's not about you. If we as a church, this is my challenge, if we as a church can begin to change our mindsets and our hearts to think about making ourselves where we can we can look about how we can help others, how we can serve each other, how we can love each other, how we can be there for each other, I promise you that you will find joy in this life. You will find peace but you'll never, ever find any joy, the joy that it talks about in the book of Philippians. You'll never find that thinking about yourself. You'll never experience true peace of Jesus when we make our lives about us. We ask the questions, how can I get ahead? How can I get more? How can I have a bigger house? How can I have a better car? How can I get promoted? How can I get this, that, this and that? And really what we should be asking is, how can I serve? I'm gonna challenge you church right here, right now is, is if you're not asking church pastors, how can we serve? How can we help? Then you're doing it wrong. because we have been called to serve. How can I make someone else's life better? How can I help? How can I give? And I'm not just talking about money. How can I give up my time, of my effort and my talents? 
How can I serve? And we, if we have the church, and I'm talking about the, the church of Christ, I'm not talking about just SEC. If we have the church are not taking on that mentality, how do we expect the world outside to take on that mentality? You see, Jesus set the example. We read his word, we read God's word every Sunday here. It will never take effect. It will never change you, it will never transform you until you get out of the me mentality and get into the how can I help you mentality. And that has to be a heart change. It has to be determination on our parts. It has to be open. It has to be us asking those questions, praying, God, give me, give me an opportunity where I can serve. Where, give me an opportunity where, where I can help someone. Give me an opportunity to where I can serve and be that person that they need. If the church doesn't do it, the world won't do it. This is what we're called to do. And, and trust me, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm preaching to myself. Because it never fails. Every time that I pray that prayer, God gives me the opportunity and what gets in the way. Well, I can't stop there. I, I, I've got to be here at, at 3.30. I can't do that right now because I have this going on or that going on. And God says, I'm giving you the opportunity. Sorry that it's not on your time schedule. I promise you, you start praying those prayers, God will give you the opportunities. But are you willing to sacrifice some of the things in life to fulfill those callings and those God opportunities? The enemy will put roadblocks in your way. The enemy will tell you, he's probably telling you right now that, that yeah, don't listen to him, he's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He just wants your time. He just wants your money. Whatever thing's rolling through your head right now. But I'm telling you that our God, I mean, grasp the idea. Your creator, my creator sent his son and he became, he became a servant. Not because he had to. He did it because he wanted to, because he loves you and he loves me. As long as we continue down this path of that it's all about me, we will never fulfill the calling that God's put on our hearts. He's put on our lives. Our church, this church and others, we need a heart change. We need a mind change. We need a mentality change. We've been called. Look, our, our mission here at SEC is very simple. It's very short. It's probably the shortest mission statement in church history. It's to go and make disciples. Your pastor, a very simplistic person. I'm not overcomplicated. But God has called us to a very simplistic go and make disciples. Making disciples means that you and I humble ourselves. And I promise you, and it, once again, this is counterculture. If we humble ourselves and we serve and we love, and we show compassion, we will win people to Jesus Christ. You see, I talked about my early stages of, of trying to get promoted. I was a fake, I was a poser. I was all about myself and I crashed and burned. But 
But when God started to transform my life, and he's still doing it to this very day, I started seeing a, a total different world. And we need to do that. We need to start asking the questions. Where can I serve? Where can I help? How can I help? How can I be the man or woman that God has called me to be? It starts with humility. It starts with us looking at others and realizing that they need Jesus. Remember that song, This Little Light of Me, My Little Mind? We want to take that light and we want to share it. You've heard me say this before. We have the antidote. We have the cure. We know the cure to the sin problem. But a lot of us, we don't share it. We don't share the cure. And we need to start. It starts with humility. It starts with love. Most importantly, it starts with Jesus. Paul continues writing in verse 12. He says, dear friends, you always followed my instruction when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. In the NIV, it says, work out your salvation. That means that God, if you've accepted Jesus, he has begun to transform you. He has begun to change you. And for you and I, that means we are to grow and learn and, and, be tra- and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us. Verse 14 says, do everything without complaining and arguing. Let me say that again. And I'm just gonna preach to myself here. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a a world full of crooked and perverse people. Do we have that today? Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is in the offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice and I will share want true joy. You want true peace. Begin that prayer. How can I help? How can I serve? You know, I was reading this week and I saw this awesome illustration that just hit me hard. The Japanese people are known to make the best swords in the world. From as far as back as the Japanese fighters and the samurai warriors, they worked and perfected what it means to have the perfect sword for combat. And what they did is they learned through trial and they learned through tribulation, they learned in battle. See, what they did is they made a sword that was of hard steel, hard metal. And that hard steel kept the blade sharp so we could cut through armor. But the sword was so brittle that it would break in the midst of battle. 
So then they tried this soft steel. And they would go into battle with the soft steel. But they realized that the sword, though soft, it would not break. But it became dull. And soon, it couldn't cut through the armor. So what they did is they went back through trials and tribulations and, and they realized that they needed to figure out a way to, to make the hard and soft metal into one perfect sword. And so they took 33,000 paper thin laminations of, of hard and soft metal and put fire and forged it into one sword. It was hard enough to keep the metal sharp to go through the armor of their enemies, but it was soft enough to withstand the other swords and it didn't break. I tell you this, because in our lives, it's the same. When I think of, of hard metal, I, I think of, of our pride and our ego. When we try to go through life with, with just our egos and just our, our pride, what happens is we break under pressure. But it's in those times where we need that soft and the softness metal and the softness of metal is prayer. It's the humility of understanding that I have to depend on God when I'm facing adversity. The hard metal symbolizes us reading God's word. When we read and we journal and we take in God's holy word, it gives us confidence, it gives us understanding. It helps us to grow and understand who God is. But we still need that softness, that dependence upon who God is. Because if it's anything I've learned in life, we will go through trials, we will go through the fire face adversity. There's no one that will not go through this life without the battle, without spiritual battles. When we can get that perfect combination of God's word, prayer, the understanding that I need to have my total life dependent upon God, he will get us through those trials and those tribulations and adversity. Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean we won't be wounded. It doesn't mean we won't have scars. But it's that perfect form of heart and soft men, God's word, prayer, utterly dependence upon him. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what trials you're going through. I don't know what battles you're in. I don't, I don't know where the enemy is attacking you, but I wanna tell you right now that you're not alone. Some of you are fighting back. Some of you are, are just, just depending on your pride and your ego and you're failing and you're, and you're, you're breaking. Allow me to encourage you right now that what you're going through what you're experiencing. You don't have to go through them. You were never made to go through those trials. You were never made to go through the fire. You are never made to battle the enemy by yourself. When Jesus came to this earth and he humbled himself and he showed us what true humility is,
so that you and I can have a way out. We can have a, a, a God that's right there with us in the fire. That's right there with us through adversity. And that we're not alone despite what our culture and our world says. So we're going to do this morning is that we're going to have a time of communion as a church, as a family. And then I want to open up our altars, our no judgment zone. Some of you may want to come forward and you want to begin the process on your knees in humility of asking God, where can I serve? Where can I begin the process of humility? Where can I be what you've called me to be? Where, where can I go where you want me to go? And some of you that are in the midst of battles, you're in the fire right now. It's on your knees in humility. That God will walk you through and help you forge that fire, that, that the hard and the soft metal and the Scripture and dependence on Him. I'm right there with you. I'm learning. I'm growing. God's transforming me. And I want you as a church to, to join me. Come alongside of me. Let's grow and learn and be used together. The only way we're going to make a change to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our friends, is if you and I are doing the things that God's called us. You know, when we do communion, I like to read from the book of Matthew. Matthew 26. Jesus was in this, he's in the room and he's at what they call the Last Supper. The disciples had no idea how their lives were about to be rocked, how they were getting ready to go through the fire. But Jesus wanted them to see something bigger and better. In verse 26, it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave thanks to, and he gave thanks, gave it to the disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. So if you take the little plastic wafer, you take and you eat. And he took a cup and we had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins I tell you I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom Stand with me. You would bow your head and close your eyes if you're able to stand. If you're not, you can stay seated. The idea of humility, the idea that Jesus would give up his body and his blood would be poured out. His true love, His true sacrifice, and it gives us freedom. So let's go to prayer.
have a time where we can just embrace who God is. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. God, I can't thank you enough for what you've done, how you've loved, and how you were the example to us. God, you truly are the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. God, there's no one like you. And what an honor and a privilege it is that we could gather as a church to learn and grow and be challenged by your Holy Word. But also, what a privilege it is. God, that you would come down and human form. Your son, Jesus, would be the living example that we need to be the people you've called us to be. So this morning, God, your word continues to change. It continues to transform us. And I pray that we are inspired give us the courage and the peace and the joy that comes along with living for you and serving others like your son Jesus did. God, thank you for who you are. In your holy name we pray. If you want to come forward, our no judgment zone altars. Hey guys, thank you for tuning in today here at SEC. Um, I pray that the message today has touched your heart and you were able to connect with God in like no other way. If you are, if you want to support the mission here at SEC, you can do that through prayer, and you can also do that through uh, financial giving. If you want to tithe here at SEC, you can go to our website at secondcc.com. Uh, backslash give. And, and there are a couple different ways that you can give. You can text to give, you can follow the link, or you can go through our app. Speaking of our app, we do have our very own uh, SEC app. If you go to the Apple Store or Google Store and look up Second CC, you can also download our app there. Finally, if you want to know what's going on at, at Second Chance Church, um, you can go to our, our website at secondcc.com and click on Church Bulletin. It is up to date every week and it lets you know all the events and everything that's going on at SEC. Once again, thank you for tuning in. We love you and God bless.